talk about the power and the value of doctrine the power and the value of doctrine I'm going to go through this very quickly so I need you to write as quick as I talk now remember when you listen to something you remember 38% of it when you write while you're listening you remember 78% of what you have written if you listen to something seven times, you remember 98% of it. So obviously you would want to get a copy of the teaching, cassette tape, or the videotape of these sessions. I want to begin with a statement that I believe is the simple and the most important heart of the message today. And that is the most powerful force the human creature possesses is the power of belief write that down the most powerful force that any human being possesses is the power of belief I used to think that the most powerful force anyone can have is the Holy Spirit or the power of God but this is not true the most powerful force that a human possesses is the power force of belief everybody say believe everybody say belief believe. belief is so powerful that it can stop the power of God you have been reminded of course when you read scripture when God said to the children of Israel that you have hindered me by your unbelief he told them that Jesus thousands of years later came to earth and repeated the same thing when he came to a certain town he wanted to do a lot of wonderful work in that town but the Bible says he could not because of their what unbelief unbelief is so powerful it can stop God's power so belief and unbelief are the same power make a note of that what you don't believe has the same power as what you do believe so unbelief is belief in the opposite position they're both the same what is belief that's the question we want to answer now what is belief belief is deep conviction it's perception of reality take a note belief is deep conviction and perception of reality belief is that which one holds to be true that's a very important statement belief is what one holds to be true so belief has to do with conviction it has to do with perception and it has to do with truth the concept of belief is expressed in many ways words like trust and hope mindset you ever heard that term mindset it has to do with belief thinking I don't like your thinking what they mean is I don't like the way you believe reality belief is also written as the word persuasion I am persuaded that means I believe certain things is also expressed in the word conviction this is my conviction about life about people about money about marriage about children what is my conviction all of these express the concept of belief the most powerful organ of man in his body is not what you think it is the most powerful organ in man's body is not the heart that pumps in the in the chest it's not the lung that brings in the oxygen the most powerful organ in man's body is the brain make a note of that we're gonna deal with the brain in this session now the brain they say is made up of 500 billion cells I don't know what kind of, of equipment that is I read in one book they changed the figures they said that the brain has 500 million cells I read another scientific book and they say the brain has over 3 
billion cells. So you got different schools of thought on how many cells the brain has. But I think we got the point. Now they say the brain has such power that it can keep stored in its membrane things that happened to you when you were an infant. And if you're 60 years old, the brain can still recall things that happened to you when you were six. That's a powerful piece of equipment. The brain is awesome. It can calculate 100,000 times faster than a computer if allowed to function. Most of us don't use it that way. But there is something more powerful than the brain. And it is the mind. The mind is more powerful than the brain. Why? Because the mind is, write this down, the faculty of thought and thinking. The mind is the faculty of thought and thinking. The mind consists of two dimensions. You really possess two minds. The first mind that you possess is the dimension called the heart. Everybody say the heart. Then there's a second dimension of your mind that is called the mind. Both of these reside in your thinking and thought faculty, the heart and the mind. The mind, first of all, is the faculty of consciousness. That's the mind, that's not the heart. The part of man's thinking that makes him aware of his immediate environment and is his reflexes. That's the mind. The mind is a part of you that has to do with reaction. It's the mechanism that works in consciousness. Right now, for example, I'm working on your mind. Your mind is what you do to make decisions all day, every moment. Your mind is how you respond to things around you. A bright light, a car that almost hits you, uh, how you look at people's clothing and what you think about people when you look at their face. That's the mind. The mind is constantly active, aware of how cold it is, how hot it is. The mind is that conscious part of your brain me mechanism that makes you aware of what's happening now. Everybody say now. The mind is a now thing. Now the reason why the mind must be distinguished from the heart is because the mind is always active, unconscious. But the heart is different. Make a note. The heart is the faculty of the subconscious. The mind is the conscious. The heart is the subconscious faculty of man. The heart is the dimension of man's thinking that stores experience. Next, it stores resolutions, which you have decided to be or to do or to go. The heart stores that stuff. The heart also stores convictions. It's where convictions lie. Convictions are not in your mind. They are in your heart. Next, the heart is where belief is stored. So you store your beliefs. The heart is also the storage of secret hopes. Hopes that you don't tell people about too much. They are in your heart. The heart is also the place where we store our fears. Deep fears. The fear of trying because you might fail. That's in your heart. The fear of getting married because you might get a divorce. That's in your heart. It's not in your mind, it's in your heart. Your heart is also the residence for your desires. It's where your deep hunger lies. It's in your heart. Now where's your heart? According to this definition, your heart is really not in your chest. Your true heart is in the part of your, your being that connects between your spirit and your mind. As a matter of fact, 
the Bible in many places called your heart the spirit of the mind. Which means you have a mind and then your mind has a spirit mind. That's called the heart. Now, as the mind is reflexive, so the heart is reflective. There's a difference. Your mind ref is a reflex. It happens quickly. Your heart is reflective. It's the part of you that ponders. It's the part of you that thinks about things. For example, your mind may decide to do something that is not right, but your heart has a meeting on it. So your heart your, your heart and your mind always sometimes have contradictions. Your mind may say, do that, and your heart may say, let's talk about it first. So your heart is a, your heart is a reflective part. Your mind is a reflex. Your mind will say, do it now, it feels good. Your heart says, let's think about it. So in your heart is where the real decisions are made. Your mind is where the reflexes are. That's why you can't trust the mind. Now, the storage of the heart regulates the reactions of the mind. Write that down. The storage of the heart regulates the reactions of the mind. Whatever is in the heart regulates the mind. So no matter what comes into your mind, that's not really what you are. You are what's in your heart. And your heart determines which your mind eventually does. The heart provides the foundational framework and material for the mind. The heart gives the mind material to work with. In essence, the mind reacts to the responses of the heart. I want you to get this because this is going to help you understand doctrine. Why it's important to not just have scriptures. You got to have doctrine. Because scriptures, somehow, they lodge in the mind. That's why you know a lot of scriptures still sin. Because when you, when you get information, it goes to your mind. But that does not change a person. You see, that is why there is a difference and a distinct element of difference between listening and hearing. Jesus said on many occasions, let these words sink down into your ears. Now he was talking to people who had two ears and they could hear. He said, but you still ain't quite hearing. Here's what I want you to write to distinguish them. Hearing takes place in the mind, but listening is done with the heart. Jesus says, I know you hear me, but you're not listening. Have you ever said this to your child? Parents probably have this. Son, you ain't listening to me. Daughter, you're not listening to me. And what you're saying is, I've been talking for a while. And you've been hearing what I say. But obviously, you haven't been listening because your behavior does not connect with what I said. Everybody see the difference? So you can hear and not listen. Hearing takes no energy. Listening is hard work. That is why most relationships are running into trouble all the time. Because people hear, but they don't listen. I remember reading the scriptures over and over again for many years and began to understand on many occasions that I, that I, I remembered information, but it did not become revelation to me. And so it would not apply to my life. The heart is the key to living. Not the mind, the heart. Until information enters the heart, it is only temporary thought. I repeat this. Until information enters the heart, it is only temporary thought. As a matter of fact, 
it will not affect the mind and behavior of the individual until it gets to the heart that is why there is a distinct difference between the two hearing and listening the heart is the source of change say that with me the heart is the source of change say it again the heart is the source of change say it loudly come on the heart is the source of change one more time the heart is the source of change change doesn't happen until it gets in your heart no matter how much you hear and a piece of information it doesn't affect you until it's in your heart you see the center of behavior and the foundation of action and the key to life is the heart the heart of man is therefore the most powerful element of man the heart of man what is the heart again it is your subconscious faculty that stores belief and convictions that regulate behavior I repeat the heart is the subconscious faculty of the mind that stores beliefs and convictions and regulates behavior in short the heart is the man and the man is his heart we find these words repeated through scripture as a man thinking in his heart say it with me so is he say it together everybody as a man think it in his heart so is he once again as a man think it in his heart so is he the Bible does not say as a man think it so is he the Bible specifically says as a man think it in his subconscious faculty where convictions are that is the real man so you can tell people what's on your mind but it's not necessarily what you believe but what you believe it always show up in your mouth and that is why we got to be careful with what's in our hearts Proverbs chapter 27 turn there with me quickly verse 19 it says as water reflects a face so a man's heart reflects the man that means the same way you look into a reflective element and you see yourself so it is with your heart your heart shows up in your life you are what's in your heart therefore your life is determined by your heart and your heart is the part of you that has your convictions your beliefs and the things that you hold to be true that is the real you Matthew chapter 5 verse 8 turn quickly it says blessed are the pure in what heart for they shall what see God God is saying if your subconscious mind is holy clean pure there's no corruption in it then you will see God in everything Wow it doesn't mean God gonna show up in the night and visit you it means when your heart is pure when you are filled with God's information when God fills your subconscious mind with what he knows everything you see you see God's work in it when you see people you see them differently that's why it's hard for man to murder a man who has a pure heart if your heart is pure you look at a man you can't kill God you know what the Bible says about murder it says any man who kills another man is destroying the image of God that is why that man must be killed come on now you all gotta read the Bible God says if a man kills another man kill the man who kill him <laughs> why it's not because of discussions about capital punishment that is irrelevant to God God says you don't understand the deeper conviction if you could kill a man that means you just destroyed the image of God and you don't deserve to live because no man can attempt to kill God and live ask Lucifer it's impossible it has to do with what conviction it has to do with doctrine what do you believe about men if you believe men are God's image you respect them even in the gutter you are careful how you treat the vagabond you be careful how you treat the basin dope addict you don't just dump them you just simply say they are not a problem they have a problem and you see them the way God sees them that's why Jesus could scrape up off the ground people who had five husbands and turn him into an evangelist why he had a conviction about his own product that he made he knew who they were his doctrine was right blessed are the pure in heart for they shall what see God everywhere they look 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. It says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let me comment on that. That means, wherever your belief is, what you believe in, you will pay for. <laughs> if you really believe in something, you'll support it and you'll treasure it and you will let it have your treasure. If you really love your wife, you believe in her. Mm, yeah, Lord. Oh, Jesus, y'all better say something to me. Hallelujah. If you really love your child, if you really love your husband, <laughs> Lord, have mercy. What do you say, Bishop Mark? <laughs> Mark, they say it. What you treasure is what you believe. We heard this morning, if you believe in sports, I mean, it's a deep conviction that if you miss it, your whole life will fall apart. <laughs> if you miss the game, you'll never be normal. You just got to have this game. Then what do you do? Then you put your money on that thing. You go and pay the ticket and go in there and spend two hours treasuring that moment in that sports game. Because that's what you treasure. You believe in it. So your belief always affects your treasure. That is why we give to God's work. Because we believe in what God is doing in this place and in other places around the world. Matthew chapter 9 verse 2. Jesus says, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Matthew 9 verse 22. It says to the, to the, uh, the woman who had the disease, he says, take heart, my daughter, your faith has healed you. Now, I want you to write the word down, take heart. Write that term down. You ever heard that before? Take heart, man. But you never probably quite thought about what it meant. The word heart has to do with the faculty of man that deals with belief. The conviction. What Jesus was saying is, believe. And your faith has made you whole. Your belief is your faith. What you believe in, you got faith in, you trust in, and you act on. Yes. Take heart. Take belief. And it shall make you whole. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. I want you to turn to this one, please. We want to read a few verses from this. Everybody say, guard your heart. Say it again, guard your heart. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Jesus is discussing about the heart. And he says this. <laughs> Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by what? Its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For only out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be what? Acquitted. And by your words you will be condemned. Please note Jesus says that the heart is the center and the source of your whole life. He said if you have an evil heart, you cannot do good. And if you got a good heart, it's terrible when you do evil. You feel bad about it. It's not in, in keeping with your heart. And that is why the fruit is connected to the root. The root is your heart and the fruit is your behavior, your words, your action. That is why doctrine must be tied to behavior. When you believe something, it shows up in the way you live. Luke chapter 10 verse 27 says, Love the Lord thy God with what? With all your heart. That means God wants all of your subconscious life to be filled with what he is and what he knows. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart. And that's the first thing on the list. It's your heart God wants. I think Luke 24 verse 25 says it best. And he said, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe. He says, how foolish you are and how slow it is for your heart to believe. I wrote a note while I was studying this, preparing this message. The Lord missed me. He said, is it possible for you to be slow at heart? He answered me. He said, yes. I said it. 
In other words, it is slow for your heart to get something that your mind had a long time ago. Your mind can get it fast, but it's slow sometimes to get it to your heart. And the trouble is, you cannot be trusted until it gets to your heart. That's why a lot of people believe in tithing, but don't tithe. Tithing is in their minds, but not in their hearts. When it's in your heart, you ain't got to be told or even be suggested. It just kind of happens from behavior. Some people say, well, you know, uh, I got to learn to love. No, if love is in your heart, then it's hard to hate anybody or be in a relationship long. I wonder why the Bible says that the love of God is shared abroad where? In our hearts. If it's in our hearts, then we don't try to love. <laughs> your conviction is love. Your preoccupation is love. That's why when love is in your heart, you cannot discriminate, nor distinguish, nor can you bring conditions into relationships. If it's in your heart, it is a natural part of your behavior. I love everybody because it's my conviction that they are worthy of love. Why? Because they are God's image. Some are temporarily insane, but still God's image. Amen. And you can love people because it's in your heart. If you got to mentally say every morning, I love people, I love people, I love people. I don't want you around me. <laughs> love is something that is supposed to be in the subconscious center of your whole being. You know, Matthew chapter 15, verse 16 to 20 says, Don't you see whatever goes into a man's mouth enters the stomach? And then out of his body but whatever goes into his heart is where the man acts I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 15 and let's read verse 19 verse 19 of Matthew 15 it's a powerful statement made by our Lord Jesus everybody got it Matthew 15 look at verse 19 For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. That's a long list. I think if we were to go to the list again and think about our nations and our communities, you'll see that we are in that list all over the place. Let's read it again. Now, what's in the heart? Out of the heart comes evil thoughts then murder now notice the whole list begins with what thoughts you don't just kill people you think about it first <laughs> why it's in your heart it has to do with a subconscious thought a conviction you know for a man to burn up his wife tells me something about a doctrinal problem in other words, our society is not without doctrine. We have been indoctrinated by the wrong information. When you've got to decide that your children and your spouse deserves to die because of your own discomfort, then you have literally reduced human life to a nuisance. What a conviction. Now, I must be honest with you, friends. The frequency of the destruction of human life in our society is too much. It's too high. Is that true? I mean, every day, somebody is shot, stabbed, or killed. And what's frightening is, we're getting used to it. But it starts from a heart condition. There's something wrong with the people's heart. And the heart is what? The thought life. The part of them that conviction is. They have convictions about things. The conviction is, if you get in my way, I diss you. That means you ain't nothing but a nuisance. You're not a image of God anymore you're not God in the flesh anymore you're not God's powerful image that he made with his own hands you're just a dog a cat you a rat you an animal you're not really a spirit in a body made in God's image you're not precious enough for Jesus to die for so I'll kill you 
You're not the one that Jesus came down and spent three and a half years in tribulation to win. You're not worth what Jesus died for. Imagine that kind of conviction in our nation. And that's what's prevailing in our country. Murders. The next list. Adultery. Now you think about the heart. If the heart is right, adultery is impossible. Is that right? I mean, if you think about people who say they love you and then they violate that love, what kind of thought, convictions do they have about love? Look at the next line. Sexual immorality. We could have a long list there. That includes lesbianism, homosexuality, fornication, bestiality, masturbation, and all the other things you know about that I don't know about. <laughs> the Bible says immoral sexual behavior is not from the mind, it's from the heart. That means it has to do with convictions, beliefs about things. That's why people who are perverted in their sexual orientation, they need some deep heart work done you can't just get saved born again in five seconds and expect for your homosexual cravings to go away hello somebody you need to be re-indoctrinated with an understanding of your sexual reality who you are in God God can save you instantly but I tell you what your heart takes a while to get converted the Bible says the law of the Lord converts what? The soul. The soul is the mind, the heart, the will, the decision-making factor, and the emotions, that which affects the behavior. I tell you, this thing goes to the heart. Look at the last one. Theft and lies. They are in the heart. If your heart is right, you have to tell the truth. If your heart ain't right, you're going to lie somehow. And you ain't going to feel no convictions about it because your conviction is lying is okay. That's why a, lying is not in the mouth. It's in the heart first. It's your conviction. If you believe that honesty is the only way to do business, then you don't have to discuss whether you are wrong or right in a situation. The next statement, slander. It's in the heart. Slander means, write this down, to tell the truth for the wrong reason. That's why they got lying and slander different in the Bible, in that list. To lie means to bear a false witness, to tell something that is not true. Slander is different. Slander is to tell the truth about somebody to destroy them. That's slander. And the Bible says that evil is in the heart. That means a person already planned to get you before they start working on the plan hello somebody evil people they know who you used to be with they know what you used to do and they start talking it to destroy you that's slander God hates it the Bible says tell the truth in love not in slander you tell the truth because you love a person and if you love a person you wouldn't want to destroy them what a powerful statement of Jesus here Look at the last part of it though. It says, these are what make a man unclean. What's in his heart makes him unclean. But eating with unwashed hands doesn't make a man unclean. It's what a man eats with his mind that destroys the man. Look at verse 8 of the same chapter. A verse that we heard earlier. And it's this, verse 8, read together for me please. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Next one, they worship me in vain. Their teachings or doctrines are but rules taught by men. God says it's possible for you to go through motions and you don't believe what you're doing. God prefer you to do what you believe in that order, you believe it first and then you do it. Therefore, doctrine is the foundation of behavior. The word doctrine, we did in our last session, it means 
teaching or instructions of God. And the Bible says we must honor the Lord with our hearts. Therefore, the storage of the heart is the essence of the man. That's it. You are what's in your heart. So the question then is, what's in your heart? And how did it get there? And who put it there? And where did you get it from? And what credit does the source have? Genesis 6, 5, the Lord looked at mankind on the earth and the Bible says the Lord saw that their every inclination of their thoughts or their hearts was only evil all the time. So the Lord decided to destroy them. Now please, when you read that scripture, get underlined two words. Genesis 6, verse 5. It says the Lord saw that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was to do evil. In other words, God knows that once it's in their hearts, it's going to show up. I better act now. Whatever's in the heart is eventually going to show up. And by the way, that is why when we talk about love, you folks who are talking about falling in love, have you noticed that when you talk about love, all through your life and history, they have love tied to the heart. You know, show you love, they always write, draw this thing called the heart. They say, I love you. They send little notes in the classroom. Hey, come on, you all all right? Yeah, little red heart saying, I love you. And they'll tie it to the heart. How come they say, I love you, and then draw a picture of the brain? And this is very serious. The next time, someone tell you they love you, and they don't send you a picture of the brain, tell them, I don't love you yet. <laughs> now, I want you to tie that to what God says. God says, if the evil thought is in their hearts, then I have to destroy them now. Because what's in their heart is going to show up. That's why Jesus said, out of the heart comes the issues of life. So when a person says they love you, your number one pursuit is to find out what's in their hearts. Now how do you find what's in a person's heart? You put them under all types of conditions before you marry them. Mm, hello. First of all, you tell them, no sex. And then you check, see how they react to that. <laughs> Come on, use your mind now, watch it. But, but if you love me, now wait a minute. Now I see what's in your heart. You ain't good for me. <laughs> Put them under pressure. Tell them, I want you to save money to buy property before we get married. Mm -hmm. Under pressure. Woman, I ain't got no time to save no money. That, that's why we can't be married, baby. <laughs> because whatever's in your heart is going to show up in the marriage. You understand? We, we normally get married, then we discover the heart. And by then it's too late, so the heart break, we call it. it <laughs> <laughs> you break my heart, they say. How could you break my heart? You never had it. I never gave you the real... Matter of fact, you know I always say this. <laughs> I'm going to say it again anyhow. People don't tell the truth in courtship. The greatest lies are told in courtship. <laughs> Why? Because you're trying to win somebody. So you keep lying. I always smell like this. <laughs> and every time you see them, they just smell like the flowers of heaven. I always dress like this. Every time you see them, they dress nice. My hair is always like this. There's never bibby in my eyes. Never. My eyes are always made up with colors. My breath is always listament, baby. And listen, when I go up and wake up, it smells like this. I just lie. <laughs> I always take you out for dinner all the time. No, we don't tell the truth. Our hearts are where the issues really lie. How many times have you heard people say this? I didn't know she was like that. And, and guess what? You done married to her? Say, Lord, I know this man was like that. 
Now that's a man, eh? I mean, all them years of being together, he was so nice. And now we married? Woo, child! <laughs> if I'm making sense, clap your hand. That's true. Huh? People, they don't show you their heart. <laughs> Even God don't trust you. Is that right? God says, you want to come to me? First, I want your heart. Love me first with your heart. I don't want your hands raised, your legs dancing. I don't trust that movement. I want your heart. Why? Because you folks know how to put on a show. You worship me with your lips, but your heart is somewhere else. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, he ain't talking to me. <laughs> Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of of your mind that word mind is referring to the heart he says you cannot be changed until your heart is changed change depends on your heart not your thinking it depends on the subconscious Paul says transformation is related to that now what is in your heart that's the question how did it get there where did it come from and what was the true source of that information the scriptures teach us that a man's behavior is simply a reflection of what's in his heart Therefore, we can know what is in the heart by one's words and behavior. It shows up. Just a quick glance at our societies and our communities and nations and our countries will reveal to us the horror that our children's hearts have been filled with the wrong information. You would agree with shock that what's in the hearts of our people everywhere is not what we really wanted. Look at the children, the youth, the adults the fathers, the mothers, the leaders. Look at the behavior of the businessmen and women, the teachers, the athletes. Look at how they think, the priests, the pastors, the politicians. How do people get like this? It has to do with their heart beliefs. Jesus warned his followers to take heed what you hear and be wary of the leaven or the teaching of the Pharisees. He told his disciples, he says, protect your ears and your senses. That's what he means. He says, take heed what you hear. That means distinguish and determine what you will allow to go into your mind. That's what he meant. You don't just watch anything and read anything and listen to anything and see anything. He says, you must be on guard. Take heed what goes into your mind, into your spirit. Why? Because there's something about the mind. Once it captures something, it starts to work it down in the heart. And the more it continues to see it, the more it has material to put in the heart. If you see something once, chances are it won't go into your heart. But if you see it four times, five times, ten times, fifteen times, thirty times, believe me friends, it's getting into your heart. And when it gets in your heart, it takes a miracle of the Holy Ghost to get it out. That is why you can be born again instantly, but it takes forever to be converted. Because God has to change your heart. Can I recommend that we take Paul's advice? And that is, be not conformed to this world. The gate to the heart, write it down, is the mind. The gate to the heart is the mind. And the gate to the mind is the senses. So whatever you don't want in your heart, you shouldn't allow in your mind. What you don't want in your mind, you shouldn't allow to stimulate your senses. It is that simple. So the control of the content of the heart is in your power. You can't tell the Holy Spirit to close your eyes for you. Try it. You can't tell the Holy Ghost to clock up your ears for you. I don't want to hear what they're saying. You can't tell the Holy Ghost you don't want to smell things and you don't want to taste things. The Holy Ghost is here to assist you not to control your life. And that is why the gate to the heart, you have the key. My question then is how did these hearts get like this? How young people in gangs 
Our young ladies getting pregnant at 12. Our people beating their wives and their husbands. Children cussing their parents. I mean, what kind of hearts do we have in our country? Keep in mind now, it's a matter of belief. If a 10-year-old tells his mother to go to hell, that means that that mother or somebody gave some information to that kid. Because according to the Bible, it says foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child and the rod of correction. Not the discussion. The rod of correction and the rod of correction there actually means discipline. Will drive it what? Out. That means children should not be left to their own regulation. If a child begins to treat his parents as if that parent is a child, then we got to blame the parent. Somebody didn't drive foolishness out. And the child begins to believe that he or she and his mother are company. I mean, and the... When I hear a son calls his father by first name, I get nervous. You listen to me good, young man. Your father is not your brother. And your belief got to be checked. You call your mother by your first name, young lady, off or son, you better check your belief. Your mother is an honorable woman. She mightn't be perfect, but boy, God says you must honor her. But it's what's in your heart. If you hang around other young people whose doctrine is they cuss their parents, they talk bad to their mothers, and you hang around them enough, you begin to think the same thing about your parents. That means your doctrine is getting a little bit tarnished. I even think about husband and wife need to have this checked. Call your wife dog. Brother, what kind of man are you? You got to keep in mind that you married a dog, so you must be a bigger dog. <laughs> and I've seen this stuff happening all over the world. People disrespecting one another. The Bible says, women, honor your husbands. And husbands, love your wife with your heart. Imagine Sarah called her husband, Lord. What a woman. Yes, my Lord. Honey, you mind in there. Just, just for that. <laughs> you call your husband Lord five times. Woo! You'll be amazed. A change will come over him. Yes, sir. He'll walk differently and talk differently. Lord, did you say Lord, baby? And after you call him Lord long enough, he start calling you. My lady, my lady. <laughs> Everybody say doctrine. It sees what you believe about the person. You know what the word Lord means? It's a frightening word. Sarah was a serious woman. The word Lord means owner. Mm -hmm. Honey, she say, owner, how you doing, baby? You own me. What you see is what you made. This is your property. I dress bad because you don't fix the stuff you own up. up. <laughs> it worked for Sarah. Abraham became a rich man. You think Sarah was walking around in rags, eh? Child, listen, that chick was so fine. When they entered the town and the king saw her, king said, that one I want. Abraham had to lie. He said, that's my sister. <laughs> Come on, clap your hand. The woman got blessed, man. She called him Lord. When she called him Lord, he put all kind of robes on her. She was fine. It's conviction. How do we get like this? How can a young boy at 13 want to join a gang so bad he takes a gun and goes out in the night 
just to shoot to get into the gang, to kill another person. Well, what kind of mind is that? What kind of mind would be in a person who would instruct a 12-year-old to do that? Convictions have gone. What is a human? Oh, just another carcass. God forbid. Jesus told us that out of the heart comes all of these murderers. The social state of our community is obvious. Jesus warned us. Be careful what goes into your mind. Everybody say, take heed. Take say it loud. I want to make a point here. Say, take heed. Take that means you take heed what comes on your TV, what comes on the cable stations, what comes on the R&D cinema. And I mean it. Write me letters. I'm serious. I saw some movies they're bringing in. I talked to some of the former gang members. You know what they told me? Say, they watched the movies and the movies show them what to do. Well, let's not be so naive. The Bible says whatever enters a man's mind enters his heart. You know, my, my son and daughter, boy, they frighten me. They watch movies over and over. You got normal children? I mean, they watch one movie over and over and over. And I'm saying, oh God, I wish they watched the word like that. They remember every word the actor says. Every move the actor makes. Now my kids, you know, they into that stuff. But I mean, I saw kids on the street. And we sit there going, well, it's not the movies, you know. It's not the movies. And the guys got the Uzis. And they walk around just like the movies. With the little piece here. They got their bodyguards. Everybody real cool. Yes, sir. And they just, everything is fine like the movies. And then we say, well, we're not responsible for that. Whatever goes into the heart shows up in the street. What goes into the heart shows up in the school. What goes into the heart shows up in the home. What goes into the heart shows up in our national life. And that's why I am so concerned by the grace of God that we will be able to impact the media and bring about some alternative indoctrination because everybody's indoctrinating somebody is that right everybody's doing it uh, I am so concerned about what I see happening and coming to this country Psalm 40 14 verse 1 says the fool of said in his heart there is no God now many of you quote that scripture but I want you to read something else for that scripture read the next three verses because the next three verses are even more dangerous. It says, first of all, the fool of said in his heart, there's no God. That means when a man says there's no God, then the next line says, they are corrupt. Their deeds are vile, and there is no one who does good. God says, once a man cancels God, then the whole country is in trouble. When a man says there's no God, then there's corruption in everything. Business, politics, schoolwork, and national life, social life, the whole thing falls apart. That's why we need to make sure we teach our children about God. Verse 5 says, they are overwhelmed with dread when they don't believe in God. They're overwhelmed with dread. Everywhere you look, there is depression in a life where there is no God. To change a man, you must change his heart. And to change his heart, you must change his mind. And to change his mind, you must change the information stored in it. The social state of our communities are a direct reflection of the indoctrination of the minds and hearts of our people. What we believe about God will affect our country and our community and our families. What we believe about man will affect our relationships with men. What we believe about sin will affect the way we handle sin. If you don't believe in sin, now you know there's no limitation to what you would do or not do. What do we believe about evil? Some folks don't believe that there's a devil. And that belief, that conviction, affects their behavior. I mean, if you don't believe in the devil, then you don't, then you don't believe in afterlife. You don't believe in heaven. You don't believe in, 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 in eternal life. If you don't believe in these things, then your life reflects that. 
Eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow we die. Let's just have a good time and blow it. There's no conviction, no doctrine in the hearts of our people today, young and old. I pray that God will give us a conviction about destiny. What about that? Is there a destiny for your life? All of these affect our every behavior and each decision that we make. We decide what to do based on what we believe. Can I suggest every man has a doctrine? Everybody, even the atheist has a doctrine. He believes that there's no God. Everybody say belief. That's a doctrine. Every human has a doctrine that they live by. Doctrines that they live by. The point is, these are self-proclaimed doctrines. The self-proclaimed atheist doctrine is to believe that there is no God. So he does have a strong belief. The only problem is that belief is going to affect you. For this reason, it's imperative that we understand the nature of indoctrination. The battle for the mind and the heart of man is the essence of life. And that's why earth is the way it is. We have all been indoctrinated. We are indoctrinated by lies or truth. The entire world of media is a world of indoctrination. Whether it is books or television or videos or CDs or music or whatever. Everybody's in the business of indoctrina in indoctrination. And whatever you are indoctrinated by becomes your regulation for living. The entire world is in the indoctrination business. However, only the truth Jesus said, can set a man free. And that is why we need to know the difference between the truth and the lie. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Set you free. What is the truth? Truth is the original intent for the reason why something was made. Truth in God's book is the original purpose in his mind why he created everything. So the only way for you to know the truth is to go back to the manufacturer, the creator of everything that is existing today. So the truth is in the heart of the creator. The truth is in the mind of the one who started the whole thing. Everybody else is lying. You know the Bible says very plainly, let God be true and every man what? A liar. That means if, 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 if you didn't hear it from God, it's a lie. And if you are indoctrinated by a lie, then your behavior is going to be anti-God. And that is why as Christians, as believers, we must submit ourselves to the indoctrination of the truth. Therefore, the only source of truth is our creator. Proverbs 3 verse 1 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life and, abide, and, and they will bring you rather to prosperity. Keep them in your heart. Proverbs 3 1. He goes on to say, Bind them in your tablets of your heart. He keeps repeating it. Take my word, God says, my son, and put it in your heart. Bind it on the tables of your heart. Tables actually referred to the clay tablets that they used to write in when it was wet. And when it was dry, it became permanent inscription. God says, well, I want my word in your heart. I want you to keep putting it there and putting it there until it is frozen, until it is burned in your heart, until nothing can get it out. He says, put it in your heart and you will prosper. The next verse says, then you will gain favor with God and man. Interesting. And then the next verse says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will what? Direct your path. Cr trust in the Lord, and he will give you what? The desires of your heart. What's going to be in your heart? What he put there. God's going to give you what he wants when he puts it in your heart. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Proverbs 15, 28 says, The heart of the righteous weighs its answers. I like that statement. I'm going to read it again. Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous woman, the righteous man, the righteous young person, weighs his answers. That means the righteous person doesn't just react to life. They observe and then they go to their heart and have a meeting. And they discuss whether it lines up with their convictions and beliefs. And if it doesn't, then their answer is according to their heart. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. I want us to just read one verse from this. We're going to wind this down now, but I want you to, to, to take this to heart. First Timothy verse, chapter 1, verse 3. 
I urge you. When I went to Macedonia, stay in Ephesus, Timothy, so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines. And don't do it any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and in sincere faith. Some have wandered away from these and turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We know that the law is good, and if one uses it properly, we also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and the rebels, the ungodly, the sinful, and the unholy, and the ir irreligious. For those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders and liars and prejurers, perjurers rather, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine, that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which is entrusted to me. Paul says, stay with the doctrines. It's a lot of good, interesting things coming out. He says, but stay with the doctrine. A lot of new religions coming out. He says, but stay with the old doctrines. Stay with what's in the word of God. No matter how much they come up with that seems to be enticing and seem to be up to date. Stay with the original doctrines that you received from the prophets, he says. God's doctrines are permanent. They never change. I think nature indeed reveals his existence to us. But there's nothing more powerful than the written word of God. God's first book is nature. You can look at nature and you can read God. Nature shows God's power, his wisdom, his intelligence, but it tells us, us of nothing about his pardon, his providence, how he provides, escape from sin. It doesn't tell us anything about reconciliation. Nature is a wonderful book of God, but it doesn't have the doctrines of God. That's why people that worship nature are considered idol worshippers to God. In nature, there's no incentive for holiness. It contains no revelation of the future, life after death. So far, sound, unadulterated doctrine, we must depend first on God's other book. And it's this book called the Bible. When we look at this book, God's other book, the Bible where we find God's revelation concerning himself and concerning man and concerning matters of life. This is the foundation for our doctrines. Jesus said emphatically in Matthew chapter 24 verse 35, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall never pass away. That is the standard of God's word. Therefore, Pilate asks a question to Jesus, what is truth? How do I know what to believe? How do I know what to put in my heart? And Pilate, you may notice, when he asked that question, he was asked in such a way as if he was hopeless. He asked Jesus, what is truth? As if he didn't know where to go look for it. He's been trying to find it. But the answer comes screaming back at all of us. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if any man come to the Father, he comes to me first. For I am the word. I am the beginning and the end. Jesus is the standard and the spoken word of God as revealed in scripture. There is no other authoritative guide to knowledge about God than the Bible. There is no other real authoritative book in knowledge of man other than the Bible. There is no authoritative book that we know have stood the test of time that is more authoritative than this book concerning the world and the future. But there is no need to grope like Pilate did and doubt in skepticism. For there is a source, the Holy Scriptures, which has the answers for truth. Second Timothy chapter 3 says, You have known the Scriptures, Timothy, that they are able to make you wise 
And they are able, able to brought, bring you into salvation through faith in Christ. The next verse says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is good for teaching, doctrine, rebuke, correction, and training, and righteous instruction. This book is good for that. So you can be fully equipped to handle life, Paul says. We must therefore, friends, build our lives on the foundation of the word of God and not allow any indoctrination other than that which God has commanded. Luke chapter 8 verse 12 says something about doctrine. It says the devil comes and takes the word from their hearts so that they do not believe. Listen to me. When you hear truth, the devil goes into action. Why? He doesn't want what's in your mind to get in your heart. That is why even after sitting under the teaching of God's word, the devil has a tremendous program to get you distracted immediately after the meeting. He would cause you to go somewhere or turn something on or listen to somebody that totally wipes out what you just heard. It's only in your mind right now. It has to get into your heart. The Bible says the evil one comes to take the word from their hearts so that they do not believe. That's a very important statement. If I can get it out of their hearts or prevent it from getting to their hearts, they won't believe it. I ain't got to worry about them hearing it. Let me tell you what I've heard often in this ministry. People just kind of tell me casually, maybe you one of them told me that. Say, you know, Pastor Miles, I don't understand. They said, you know, some of the best teaching in the world takes place at this place. And yet people still mess up. And people say to me often, saying, I don't understand. Huh? I mean, they sit under the word. I've had people who live in other countries who hear me teach. And they'd say, I want to move to the Bahamas to come to your church. And I used to say to myself, stay where you are. What's the difference between those people who take what is taught and put it into practice? When I go back to visit them, they own three businesses. They're grown in the Lord. Their marriage is healed. I mean, they put the stuff to work. And I go and visit them and they say, you know, you changed my life. And I say, wow, one teaching. Change their lives. And then people sit under the word for a million teachings. It doesn't change their lives. And the difference is right here. Satan comes immediately, Jesus says, to steal the word so it doesn't enter their hearts so that they may not believe. I think you should make a commitment this year. Personal one, maybe. It take a little discipline. And that may mean every teaching you hear, you're going to buy the tape. And you're going to say, when I leave the meeting, that whole week, I'm going to soak in that tape. And I'm going to put myself the time aside to soak up what God said to me until it enters my heart. Devil, you ain't never going to steal another word that I hear from God. You got to talk to him. And you got to drown him out with constant repetition of the word. Until it gets in your heart. Once it gets in your heart and it's burned there, he can say what he wants. Why? You're going to respond out of your heart. Maybe Satan has been successful in preventing good information to never become revelation by keeping it out of the heart. When you go home and you turn the TV on and you watch that game or you watch that soap opera or whatever, and that stuff just drowns out the word that you heard. And then you wonder why, you know, soap opera comes on every night. And I teach twice a week. The competition. And when you hear something often, it becomes a doctrine. So who do you think is going to win? And you wonder why your life is becoming just like the soap opera. And not like the word of God. Take heed what you hear. Because the evil one comes immediately to steal the word. I'm like a sower this morning. I'm throwing the seed. It's landing on all kinds of soils in this auditorium. I don't know what condition your life is in. It may be rocky. It may be good soil. Maybe it's just stone all by itself. Just hard, callous, stone hard. Nothing happens. I pray today that it would be one of those where there's good soil. Jesus told a story about doctrine. And I close with this story. 
He says in Matthew chapter 7. Let's turn there please. He said there was a man who built a house. And the house was built on sand. And the foundation of that house was not stable. Verse 24. He's talking about the word, doctrine, teaching. He says, and when the winds blew, verse 25, and the rains came down and the storms rose up against that house. That one fell. But the one that was on the rock did not fall, did it? That one did not fall. Ladies and gentlemen, as we enter this series on teachings of doctrine, I hope that God would dig up underneath the sand that many of our lives have been built on. We're not sure of the pillars of our faith. Jesus said in verse 24, read it out loud with me. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Not just hears, but practices, applies, believes, is convicted by. Conviction is on what you hear. You act on it. He says, that's a wise man and your life is on solid rock. I am proud of of what I see in so many lives.